Leadership International presents Dr. Chan Abraham in A Year of Reinforcing Priorities and Goals. 2020 Vision, The Road to Renewal. So here we are, a year of reinforcing priorities and goals. I wonder how, how it's been for you, whether you feel you've made progress throughout this year. I hope so. I hope you feel that whatever may have been the challenges and the difficulties, the stubborn obstacles that sometimes afflict our lives, that you've been able to see some change, that you feel you've moved on. Because the message we try and have in our business is very much about we can make the difference and we can be different that we don't have all of the answers, but we have some of them. And we have a great many of the, more of the answers because we're together and we're focused on the things we want to do. So my brief talk, the last talk of 2014, is based on our calendar theme for this month, which is about investing in a brighter future. Now, throughout uh, the month of December, you will have seen the posters that have been on walls across our corporate offices, which tell the story of a Christmas carol. It's actually 171 years, almost to the day, that Charles Dickens published this little book called a novella, A Christmas Carol. It was on the 19th of December, 1843. Imagine that. And this is a book that has never been out of print. It's been in film and opera. It's much loved. And, and well, how many of you have read it, actually, the C a Christmas Carol? And of course, we've put it on the intranet, so you've been able to read it at your leisure uh, as a PDF if you want to. But it, uh, our posters over these last few weeks have been giving you some illustrations, the, some of the original uh, woodcut illustrations from the first edition to help you to think about what the people of 1843 would have been thinking about as they read this amazing story. And what it is, as you know, is, is a story about a chap called Ebenezer Scrooge, from which actually we get the popular term, he's a real Scrooge, which means someone who is miserly or tight. And uh, it's a story of a guy who, at Christmas time, is uh, met by three ghosts, three spirits who talk to him about Christmas past, about Christmas in the present, and about Christmas in the future. And because this man is so tight and so miserly, he really is uh, a nasty piece of work. He's very selfish, but it was not always so. Uh, and in his office, he has a, uh, a poor clerk, uh, his version of the corporate administration team, and uh, this guy, a chap called Bob Cratchit, who is a bit of a salt-of-the-earth kind of individual. He has, he's a poor man, and he is only given Christmas Day off, 25th of December. And uh, Ebenezer Scrooge says he, he, he th thinks it's a gift, but in fact, it's the custom of the time. People didn't. People used to work very long hours uh, in the immediate aftermath and the, the height of the Industrial Revolution, uh, a very, very difficult time. And in Bob Cratchit's home, he has a big family, but he also has this little boy, a crippled boy, Tiny Tim, who is really very ill. So the ghosts visit Ebenezer Scrooge on Christmas Eve. The ghost of Christmas past is the first of those. But prior to the ghost coming, Ebenezer Scrooge is visited by the ghost of his long-dead partner, Jacob Marley. Marley's ghost comes to him, clanking great chains around him. He's also got, he's got a bandage over his head. And um, to his horror, when the ghost takes the bandage off, his jaw completely drops to his chest. So it's a scene of horror, actually. And, and naturally, Ebenezer Scrooge is, is terribly afraid, shocked, surprised. And the, the ghost explains to him that this chain that he's got is one that he forged through his life because he lived only for business. He lived only for money. He lived only for himself in much the same way as Scrooge is living today. Now, at this time, 
the middle of the 19th century, as many of you will know, Britain was the world's superpower. Powerful navy, a huge empire that had been uh, amassed uh, with all of its great wealth through conquest. And the repercussions of that, of course, are still felt today in all sorts of ways. And Britain really did rule the waves. But while many in this country celebrated, or some rather, celebrated great wealth and prosperity, there were others for whom it really was a sad and miserable existence. Britain, and especially the great cities, the industrial cities, to which the rural poor had flocked for work, was a place of slums, of disease. Cholera was rampant in the country, of immense poverty, very high levels of child mortality. So large families, but children dying very young. And the working poor really only were able to forget their worries and their ills by heavy drinking. There was a lot of violence, um, uh, child abuse, which we don't hear much about because we haven't got the records of it, must have been rife. And children were sent to work up in chimneys, tiny little children, and they worked in mills. Uh, many of them uh, lost limbs or would have died there in that situation. And Charles Dickens' story is, as much as anything else, a Christmas carol, a story to help people to think about what was going on in the country at that time. So we have this, this terrible situation where, on the one hand, we've got people who are experiencing so, so much, and on the other, people who have so little. And we can think about our own world and uh, a situation where there are those. And we celebrate, don't we? We celebrate wealth sometimes. We, we aspire to it. Have people got the X factor? Extraordinary. In a world that now is living off its past, uh, in the West, especially in Britain, of this incredible wealth amassed because we conquered nations, we had a, a colonial past, we now believe that the best way to live, the celebrated way is to have so much. And we, we think about these people, such as the folk I've put up here, and think they must be so happy. They've got it all. She's opened up her own clothing store, as though that's the be-all and end-all. I don't want to begrudge that. I'm just asking about where our values are. What is it that uh, binds us together? Is it great wealth or is it our common humanity? And just as in the case of Jacob Marley, so... The tragedy is that the extent to which we have got things wrong, particularly since the uh, 1960s, has actually chained us. I think we are in a situation now where we have lost any sense of what our real values are, especially at a time like Christmas, which is where why Charles Dickens aimed his incredible story to strike at the heart of the nation and to say, look, here we are, some of us are celebrating at this time and yet there are others living in abject poverty. And so the ghost of Christmas past comes and then leaves him. And he's then visited, Ebenezer Scrooge's, by the ghost of Christmas present. And he's asked to consider, well, look at the things that are happening around. And, and he's visited, he t he's taken to places where he sees people celebrating Christmas at the present time. And of Christmas in our country today, well, I, I mean, with all apologies to the royal family, I just felt it was a great example. And there will be many scenes like this, not necessarily with corgis running around with uh, uh, bows on their heads, of course, uh, but there will be many scenes of families having a happy Christmas, and we don't begrudge that at all. But that's not the point. But the point is, Christmas Day will be over so quickly. You know, within 24 hours of... Uh, those celebrations on the 25th of December, some people will be thinking about taking their decorations down. The turkey will be cold and getting ready for turkey sandwiches the following week. There will be mounds of wrapping paper filling our rubbish bins. But they'll still be lonely and poor and dejected and isolated people. There'll still be emergencies in, within our National Health Service. We will still have a whopping great uh, deficit to deal with. We will still have people who treat other people very badly. We will still have bosses 
in organizations who do not know how to motivate and manage their people. We'll have still, still have people who are miserable about going to work. And perhaps they will be miserable, especially since they're at work after Christmas. And we will still have Britain with its brokenness. That is our Christmas present. I don't mean our Christmas gift. I mean the present time of Christmas. And I'm not wanting us to, to take away from the joy of Christmas. That's not the point. And I hope I'm not depressing you. What we're seeking to do here, just as Dickens was doing, is to say, let's just think about what's going on. Let's have a, uh, a little bit more awareness about the world in which we're living. And you see, the people of that time, the Victorians, for whom the 20th century has been so unkind, you know, we often talk about the Victorians as being sexually repressed, and perhaps some of them were. It's a bit odd to say that on the one hand, and then to see how big their families were on the other. However, uh, those, many of those Christians, uh, those, those Vic Victorians, who were Christians, felt that present conditions had to change, that the future had to be saved, and the nation had to be renewed. For them, their view was that they could not let this go unchallenged. And so they set about. They set about making the change, which takes us back to our story and to Christmas future. Because the next ghost comes, a really frightening one, because it's really the ghost of death, and shows Ebenezer Scrooge the future. And he comes to a death scene. And in this room, there is a coffin. There aren't many mourners. There are the people who worked for the deceased. And what they do is they start handing out his possessions, such as they were. Because although the deceased was a wealthy man, he had very few. So they, they were talking about taking the curtains down and giving them, taking his collar tabs and giving them, because there's not much value there. And he dies an unmourned death in an unmarked grave. And by this time, Scrooge, who knows that this is he, is saying, does this have to be my future? Does it have to be that? He's also seen that this is, this is actually Christmas one year on from now. He sees that little tiny Tim has died because Bob Cratchit, who worked for him, did not have enough money on his meager salary that Scrooge paid him to look after his poor little sick boy. And by now, um, Scrooge is, his heart is changing. He's also, when he looked at Christmas past, he was reminded of what he was like many years ago before he became this, this person who really didn't want to laugh, didn't want to be happy, who used the term bar humbug, which is where we get that phrase from. And it's a bit like that person who came into our celebration of Christmas yesterday and talked to Brian and said, I hate Christmas. Well, maybe they had good reasons. But do you know, if we hate anything in that way, if we allow our lives to become resentful and bitter, ultimately the person who loses out is us. Just like Scrooge here was losing out. He was losing out everything in his life. You know, the Christmas story, whether we believe or not, whether we are followers of the way that the Christmas story talks about, Christmas be brings to everyone a sense of hope, a sense of joy, a sense of being able to be friendly. All of those are part of the blessings of Christmas, whether we believe it or not. After all, it gives us a holiday, a public holiday, time off work. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that something, some reason to celebrate? And so Scrooge is left with this opportunity. He is told that he can change the future if he changes the present. And interestingly, we, we saw some couple of years ago, I think, on our uh, televisions, I saw a little bit of this Ian Hislop's um, documentary about the age of the do-gooders. Did anyone see that? Some of you did. And he talked about Victorian reformers, about the things that they did. You see, the early part of the Victorian era, the early part of the 19th century, up to 1840, this country was still actively participating in the African slave trade. It had been going on for 300 years. Can you imagine that our country made incredible wealth by trading in people who were, who were treated as chattels, actually. And in some cases, it was better, from an insurance point of view, to throw these slaves overboard and claim for their loss than to have the money you could get by selling them 
in, uh, in America. And William Wilberforce led a campaign that lasted 40 years and brought about the abolition of slavery uh, for Britain and the empire. It took longer in America, and some would argue that in the States there still has not been that full emancipation, even with a, a black president. That's, a, that's another discussion for another day. But as a result of this pioneering spirit that William Wilberforce ha had, and it's very difficult for us now to transport ourselves back into that world, but he went against the grain, he went against the tide. He was not popular with the government, he was not popular with the Church of England, which had its own uh, slaving activities. But he still did that. He was prepared to give up his life and his possessions. He died a poor man. He was very wealthy to begin with, but he died a poor man and a sick man because he had sacrificed everything to change the world. But as a result, numerous reformers stood up. People who started uh, a variety of different societies. That's where we had uh, the emergence of some of our free hospitals, of education. The first ragged schools for street children were created. That's where we get the idea of Sunday school in churches. That's where it comes from. Because these children were just on the streets. Because the working poor drank so much strong gin, brewers, uh, who, like the Whitbread family, began to brew weak beer so that they could still enjoy a drink but without killing themselves. And many other societies, including the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, that was something that was started by William Wilberforce as well. Uh, our housing movement, the, the thing that we now are involved in, that started, the movement for sanitation. Uh, the story of Florence Nightingale, which many of you know about, uh, that emerged then. Uh, some of the great banks, who of course have changed their traditions now, uh, but Barclays was one of them, they started because uh, people of faith felt that they wanted to enable people to have a way to look after their savings and to be thrifty. And so amazing things happened because of these Victorian reformers. Their Christmas future became a reality. Can you, can you put yourself back 170 years in the world that was then? It's unimaginable. You think about the child abuse that we have seen on our screens, the, uh, on our television screens and in the news, and the, uh, the horror that we have felt, how we've recoiled. You multiply that by a thousand times, a thousand times, and it, you begin to understand the horror that was taking place in the 19th century. Impossible to imagine, but it was a horrible place in that sense, despite all the wealth. But they were determined that the future had to change. Their Christmas future then became a great reality. And so the ghosts leave him, and Scrooge wakes up on Christmas morning. And he goes out, and he is a transformed person. Now he's wishing everyone a happy Christmas. He sends a great Christmas turkey anonymously to Bob Cratchit. He raises his salary. He goes to and is reconciled uh, uh, with his nephew, Fred. And Scrooge's life is absolutely transformed. They say of Scrooge, he knew how to Christmas, uh, no, keep Christmas well because there was such a transformation in his life. And you know, that is very much like what we're seeking to do today. It is so much in parallel. And I want us to uh, look forward, look to the future, look to 2020 and say, right, we're going to change ourselves and we're going to transform the world to believe that whatever is required of us to come across that bridge and to be transformed, it can happen to us. So this has been a year of reinforcing priorities and goals. I dearly hope that every one of us has begun to understand what really is important to us and has begun to focus on those. The year that we're coming into, 2015, you'll see this from your calendars, which will be on your desks later today, is going to be a year of reinvigorating trust. Not so much in us. We believe our customers do trust us, that we have great relationships, but we want to strengthen that. But in the world around, we've seen the fabric of trust being so utterly uh, eaten away and eroded. Somehow, we need to see that. We need to see people trusting each other more, trusting their neighbors, uh, trusting the government, trusting local authorities, trusting even the media to give us the truth and not some kind of propaganda, which is actually what happens most of the time, the stuff that we see. 
None of our news channels gives us the stories exactly as they are. Trust is something that we'd like to see in as part of our road to renewal. So, and with these words, I want to close. Whatever Christmas means to you this year, whatever it means, I want to hope and pray that you will have a really happy one. I also want to encourage you to come across the bridge, whatever the change is that you need to make in your life, to focus with me on our 2020 vision, to focus on the road to renewal, to say, right, I'm going to change myself in the year ahead, and I'm going to work with my colleagues to transform the world in 2015. Colleagues, friends, can we do it? Yes, we can. Thank you very much.